slowly getting started here. A couple more minutes will begin. I'm actually going to crack a window. People are funneling in. 31 participants and counting in the room tonight. This is great. Angela, Ann, Barb, Beth, Bill, and Daphne, Dale, Debbie, and Dennis, Dina, Diane, Dolores, Doug, Elaine, Eugene, George, Heather, James, Joyce, Keith, Marion, Mary Beth, Rita, Rob, Sandy, Sheena, Sue, Sylvia, Ursula, got a packed house, Mike, Bob, Chris, and I'm Jackson. It's great to have everyone here and counting. We're hoping that Zoom becomes a hybrid option sooner than later. I'll talk about that in a second. Oh, I guess it's 7.30, so we can technically begin our second of the year bird study group meeting. Hello, everybody. I am broadcasting to you live from downtown Hamilton, Ontario, really close to the epicenter of the Hamilton study area, which you can see there on the right-hand side. Uh, the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. This land is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to care and share for the resources around the Great Lakes. We acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1972 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And tonight's an interesting night, and I was thinking about this today because this is the, across the province, the, the day of the municipal election. Um, and so I know that a lot of folks are going to the polls, and folks are going to the polls with several things in mind. And perhaps like you, um, the environment is a thing that was near and dear to your heart, and maybe you picked someone tonight um, who also has values akin to yours. And your values are likely very close to similar ones that the Indigenous people held prior to colonization. Um, we know that there uh, are mega connections to the planet Earth that Indigenous people have and that we have as naturalists and, and nature lovers and Earth supporters. Uh, and I wanted to share this. So if you haven't checked out the Creator's Garden, um on social media as possible uh joe pitawanaquat has been doing some pretty incredible work and i'm looking up something right now where uh he's created something pretty cool and i'm trying actually i've reached out to joe uh and one of his partners who works for birds canada andres to um be part of the bird study group because joseph is working to create a resource um naming the native birds to this region um, in Anishinaabek. And it's really interesting to see the names that they're coming up with already. There's a really cool article that the CBC has shared, which I can post in the chat when I'm done um, my spiel here. But um, it's a really amazing product uh, project that I want Joe to come speak to the BSG for. I've already emailed them, so I'm waiting to see if he'll get back to me for a December or January date. Um, but it's a first of its kind, and it's an ongoing catalog of taking the bird names that we know, and he's providing names to them um, in an Indigenous language, which is pretty incredible. And he's akin to a lot of the names to the plants that the birds associate themselves with. So it's a really interesting article. I'll be sure to share that with you. Um, so hopefully we'll hear from Joe in the future. Um, so if you're joining us tonight, it's your first time here. We do this virtually once a month. Uh, my name is Jackson Hideki. I'm the Bird Study Group Director for the Naturalist Club. And um, how this typically works is I'll give a little preamble, sometimes a long preamble, before introducing our special guests. We've got the chat function on. So at any time tonight, there's 46 of you in the room and climbing. At any time tonight, uh, you have anything to share, throw it in the chat, throw it in the Q&A if it's a specific question for our special guest. 
Um, and the presentation tonight and, and most of these nights last anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes long um, with the Q&A to follow. So by all means, let us know anything in that chat. We just try to keep bird conversation going. We keep our mind on birds uh, beyond what we're seeing and hearing in the field. We want to bring a conversation to the forefront um, as it pertains to, to bird ecology, to threats, efforts, trends, or predictions. We want to amplify the voices of people in the community who are out there um, learning and making a difference. And we want to bring the average person, the beginner birder or the expert birder alike to the same spot. And that's why you're here. Last month I shared the ABA um, and thus shared by Birds Canada Code of Ethics. And I've, I've, I've shortened this down to be really quick points because we're for a lot of folks do it for, for very particular reasons and some do it for the bigger picture. So while you're out in the field, as long as you're remembering a few of these really important things to respect and promote birds in their environment, to respect and promote the birding community and its individual members. So if you see someone with binoculars out there, have a chat with them, say hello, feel free to share some sightings in the area with them, but we want to encourage uh, more and more folks to be taking on this wonderful hobby. Uh, and we want to respect and promote the law and the rights of others, especially as it pertains to private property, uh, and knowing what rules and regulations are are wherever you are birding. So just some things to keep in mind, because um, we want to always promote good practices um, so that we can see all of these great birds. Uh, and if you want to learn more about that, the ABA or the American Birding Association or Birds Canada, you can just look up the Code of Ethics and these all those bullets kind of break out into even more. So always good to just keep those front and center. Study area, the 40 kilometer radius from here in Hamilton. So whether you're out in Milton or Puss Lynch or um or Caledonia or Grimsby or anywhere in between or out in the middle of Lake Ontario, uh, what birds are you seeing? So fall migration sure is ticking along. We've had some really interesting and some great sightings. About a month ago, um a Swainson's hawk was seen and photographed quite low over the Burlington Bluffs. Nelson Sparrow has been seen quite a bit, um, although hasn't been seen much lately. I still have yet to see a Nelson Sparrow, but hopefully someday. Warblers are still kicking around. Some of you folks may have been lucky enough to see um, the prairie warbler. I initially had prairie warblers because there was some discussion on Discord about whether or not there were two prairie warblers or it was one and then maybe a Nashville nearby. Uh, but black-throated green and palm warbler are still being seen. Um, another rarity of the western kingbird has been seen in the Hamilton study area. Folks have been seeing yaggers along the shorelines of Lake Ontario and an onshore black-legged kittiwake seen by Helen Hopkins, which was a pretty, again, on Discord, funny discussion of, uh, do kittiwakes ever come close to shore or land on shore? I've got this interesting bird. She shared the picture and sure enough, um, a black-legged kittiwake was just sitting on the shore. And, and so she shared this great picture and allowed me to share it with you all tonight. So how cool is that? So when you're looking at gulls on the shore, look at them all because you might have a unique one sitting there. A red fowler was seen, I think, just um, out around the same area where this kittiwake was seen, which is around Van Wagner's Beach in Hamilton. Folks have been seeing evening grosbeak flocks. I don't think there's been any photos of them sitting anywhere, but they are definitely around. And in keeping with, you know, the, the winter finches that work their way through, large numbers of purple finch have been seen in the area in the last couple of weeks. Um, some people have, there's been some more sightings of American pipits and some pine siskins even. Uh, but on the late side of things, uh, someone encountered a chimney swift just the other day, which is getting pretty late for them. And George Naylor was reporting hundreds of swallows along the Grand River the other evening. Um, and then a, a, a high number of fish crows um, were seen just in the Halton region uh, by Cheryl Edgecombe, 23 at once. So we know that there are breeding fish crows in the Hamilton study area. Um, so that's really neat to know because a couple years ago and even recently, um, you know, the, the, the rare and fish crow were in the same conversation. And now that they're breeding and around quite a bit, the rare side of it is is trickling away. But I bet you if, uh, if a non-birder were to hear a fish crow, that would be rare to them. Um, 
And so gulls and waterfowl are starting to return. There are the other day there were hundreds and like 500 or more um, waterfowl sifting through the Coots Paradise Marsh. Um, plenty of teal and widgeon and pintail and gadwall. Um, so things are starting to show up. The all three scoters we're seeing. Um, what are you seeing? What's making you excited about birding these days? What is a, a, a unique sighting to you that you can share with us? Throw it in the chat. Let us know what you're seeing uh, and what's making you happy about birding. The last thing I wanted to share was just this image of the range of a black-legged kittiwake because you can see they don't typically come inland or you know too close to us very often but i wonder if that blue shade will trend its way around lake ontario over the coming years uh, so a neat range map thanks to allaboutbirds.org if you're looking to do something in the community there is a rubber boot walk of the sheila dunduli nature sanctuary on saturday november 5th in the morning um, you can email jen baker land at hamiltonnature.org for more information, but the hope is to get people working their way down, 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 that really steep ravine and helping clean up a lot of the litter that has shown up down there over the years. Um, we know that the big highway's right there and as well Snake Road. So we'd love your help um, down at the bottom of the Sheila Dunduli Nature Sanctuary. So um, yeah, let us know if we can count on you for that. And as well, you can be in a really cool spot that not many people have gone. We don't want lots of people down there. That's kind of the beauty of that part of the of the sanctuary. The hills are so steep that there is very little human physical impacts on the soil. So you might see some pretty cool things there. Um, the following day is the Allen Wormington Fall Bird Count. A lot of you have probably, um, that you probably have your patch, but if you are around on that Sunday, anytime between 12.01 a.m. and 11.59 p.m., and you want to contribute to the count, reach out to Bill Lamond. Uh, his email address is there, bill-lamond at hotmail.com, to just let him know you're interested. He can either send you to a patch um, that needs a person in it and covering that area for the count, uh, or you can just let him know you're willing to work with another group of folks and he may ask around uh, on your behalf for a group that you can join. It's a great uh, annual event. And November 6th, like, that starts to be a time where it can be pretty cold. Um, you know, a lot of the migrants have worked their way through already, but there are some lingering ones. And the more eyes out there, the better chance of, of folks uncovering something pretty cool in the Hamilton study area. So won't you join us for the Allen Wormington fall bird count? That would be great. Um, all right. Um, there isn't an update from the bird-friendly Hamilton Burlington group necessarily. They did have a great campaign for a Lights Out Hamilton and Burlington uh, last month, especially during migration. So if you are keeping lights on or have a neighbor or have a friend, you can share with them this really cool poster or slip it in their mailbox as a way to just remind them to keep those lights off at night. We'd love for you to be a member of the Hamilton Naturalist Club. Um, you can volunteer even if you're looking for something, if you're looking for a way to give back to the greater good. And if you aren't following the Naturalist Club on, on social media, I, I put this slide up last month because um, we were trying to crack the 3,000 mark. And if I look at the Hamilton Naturalist Club account now, yeah, we're at 3,100 folks on the Naturalist Club instagram page so we'd love to have you there and as part of the conversation but there's a bustling community in hamilton there are many ways of getting yourself involved um, or just learning about the birds that are around here so through facebook instagram discord um, through listservs or through a variety of groups um, there's no shortage of ways of getting yourself into this amazing hobby and there are ways of of connecting with any of these um names down here the pippets the larks um rbg conservation halden hca um let us know reach out to me bird study group at hamiltonnature.org if you ever want something promoted or shared heck if you even know somebody who would want to give a talk to the bird study group let me know and i'd be happy to start that conversation and lou um is doing the work for the general meetings that happen once a month and in that light, uh, on November 14th, the next general meeting is going to be about bat conservation at the Toronto Zoo with Bridget Sparrow uh, Sinoka or Sinoja. I have not met Bridget, so I'm 
probably not saying her last name correctly, but that's going to be the next talk uh, for the general meeting, which is pretty cool uh, to learn all about bats. So we'd love to see you there. Again, that will be virtual. And the next bird study meeting was has just kind of been confirmed. Um, Olivia Maillet will be speaking to us. Uh, they are a student from Trent University, and they're going to be giving us a talk on the red eye flight secrets from the subarctic shorebirds migrating through Ontario. And uh, they're working on their masters right now, so this is going to be a really neat talk. And they've got an, an Instagram account, the Dowager Queen, which you can likely follow. And there's some pretty, um, I think it's public, I'm pretty sure it's public, um, but there's some pretty cool images of Olivia there doing field work. And this is where I learned of just how buggy um, certain parts of Canada are. Um, they've shared some pretty interesting images of just gigantic flies swarming them and their cars during uh, the field work season. So we'd love to have you out on Monday, November 21st, right back here on Zoom. We can hear from Olivia and maybe December will be Joseph talking all about the cool project um, with naming birds in the Anishinaabe language. Okay, with that being said, we're going to get to tonight's special guest. Um, so we're going to hear from the one and only Bob Curry. So this year, Bob and his wife, Glenda Slesser, drove from Burlington to Vancouver and back. Their quest was to see Western Canada in all its natural splendor of mountains, prairies, and coasts. And they wanted to see some new Canada birds and any other animal or plant they happened across. When I asked Bob for a a, a little biography on himself or anything I could share with you if you don't already know who Bob is. Because most folks, most birders have come across or own Birds of Hamilton and surrounding area written by Bob Curry. Um, so Bob, could I could have many folks give very lengthy um, biographies on Bob, but Bob shared that he grew up in Hamilton birding and reading bird books. Today, decades later, he is still birding and reading bird books. So, folks, let's put our hands together for the one and only Bob Curry. Bob, thanks so much for being here tonight. You can turn your camera on, share your screen. The night is yours. Let me go back to share the screen. And then I have to go to slideshow. Where's that? There. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Jackson. Uh, and uh, uh, ladies, gentlemen, and friends of mine, uh, Jackson has been most helpful in getting me this far, and but that's no guarantee that it will go smoothly, but uh, we'll, we'll do the best we can. Uh, part of it, of course, is because this is still COVID, and we're doing it this way. I'd much uh, much prefer to be in front of you and, 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 and addressing you in person. Uh, one, one of the effects of COVID, of course, they, the, the instructions were to stay home. And uh, our interpretation, Glenda and my interpretation of that was that uh, a couple of years ago, we, we drove to Nova Scotia. And last year, we flew to Newfoundland and spent a few weeks there. And this year, we drove across the country from uh, Hamilton to the West Coast and back. This is a map that uh, uh, you can uh, produce on eBird. eBird is an, always enhancing the birding experience. Uh, but uh, I have to thank uh, Mike Burrell, the uh, eBird guru uh, and uh, for Ontario for making this map appear on in, on my screen. I couldn't do it with, with eBird itself. Anyway, so each of those dots represents uh, uh, at least one checklist in one place of going out to the West Coast and, uh, and coming back. So we decided that, that we would start about May the 1st. We actually left on, on May the 2nd. And and we knew that it would be cold in Northern Ontario. Here is uh, here, as you can see, is May the third in Algoma. All almost all the lakes were frozen. Piles of snow in the bush. Uh, our friends Dave and Mary Elder, who've been in Atacokan for 49 years, said this was the coldest 
longest winter in their entire experience there. So we picked a, a difficult year to start out so early. Uh, we went to, to Rainy River. Uh, Rainy River is a destination for uh, a desired destination for Ontario birders uh, because it's in the extreme northwestern part of the province and, and, and has breeding birds in particular that are found nowhere else. When we got there, it was cold. Uh, the, the spruce woods were quiet. There were no kinglets, no wrens, no warblers, nothing. But we did see our target bird here. Uh, Glenda had never seen American three-toed woodpecker, and uh, we, on cool, crisp mornings, we could hear them drumming, and we saw five over two days. Um, Jackson, I'm just, is this, is this, uh, on, on the right side of my screen, I have uh, uh, Jackson and Michael and HNC. Is, is everybody else have that, or can they see the whole image? I think, I think that's just what you can see, Bob. Um, okay. If That's you fine. click up on, you can drag that anywhere. You can move that anywhere you want. Um, folks, I think, are mostly just seeing your screen with the three-toed woodpecker and you on it. Okay, so I've dragged it off to the side that, so that at least most of the, uh, and, and they can just see me. Okay, all right, uh, I'll, I'll carry on then. It was a bit off-putting to see all those areas covered. Uh, okay. Um, you might wonder why in this trip across the country, I'm showing a bird that's quite common in Southern Ontario, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Well, the reason is that uh, there are more sapsuckers to come as you cross Canada. Now, if there's any, any uh, doubt that uh, the prairies seep into Northwestern Ontario, uh, the Franklin's ground squirrel is, is uh, an, an example of a prairie animal. I was delighted to see this at roadside in, in Rain and River. Had never seen one before in the province. Common enough further west, but you know, we like to see, play these games where we see them uh, in our own province. Uh, when you go to Rainy River, there's a there's a motel in, in the in the town of Rainy River, but there's virtually nowhere to eat. And it, so we stayed at uh, Taboni's Bed and Breakfast uh, and paid paid extra, I mean, that's hardly the point, but we paid to have our, our breakfast and dinner there because uh, in, in Rainy River, if you don't like uh, uh, Burger King or something, that's all you're gonna get. So uh, it, was a, it was a delightful place to stay. Uh, and in back of uh, Marlene's uh, uh, b and &B, when you get up early in the morning, you can hear the sputtering and uh, rattling of a sharp-tailed grouse leck right from the house, right from the, the yard. Uh, this one is a few blocks away, a little later in the day, they disperse uh, from, from the lek. Uh, um, and, and then you can see them. Now, um, another prairie bird, really, we see them in migration here, uh, uncommonly, but uh, they're up to, uh, Dave Elder says, about 10 pairs breed at Rainy River, and we saw one. Uh, they were just arriving back, I suspect. Uh, anyway, that was a little taste of the prairies, the part that, we've, that we have experienced before. Uh, and, and now I'm going to uh, uh, take you through the prairies, combining both going and coming. Uh, um, you know, this, the, the, we saw a few uh, old type elevators. Most, mostly, they're they're this uh, this new type. Oops, sorry. Um, mostly, they're this new type. Um, and here is a combination elevator at Rock Glen, Saskatchewan, uh, in the extreme uh, southwestern part of uh, Saskatchewan. It's the the heading off point for if you want to go to Grasslands National Park, Grasslands National Park, some have called the Serengeti of Canada. It's a wonderful place. And it's here. And you might say to yourself, well, why are you telling us about that? And you didn't even go there. The problem was that we stayed in a, in a dingy old motel in, in Rockland, Saskatchewan, the only, one, only place available. Uh, the the lady of the motel said, uh, well, I, I can serve you uh, what I'm serving my family tonight. And so we had a nice, an authentic uh, East Indian meal. But overnight, big storm, heavy rain, sleet and so on. This was, uh, I'm trying to remember the date, but it was about uh, the 
10th of May, 10th or 11th of May. And so we, the, the locals told us, you know, you won't be going into Grasslands Park. The roads are all gravel and they'll be, it'll be closed off uh, because you'd get mired and stuck. So we had to miss it. Could have gone on the way back, but we were tired by that time. Lots of birds in Rockland the next morning, warblers and, and harris and sparrows and things that had been knocked down in the storm. And I dare say some of them wouldn't have fared all that well. Um, Jackson mentioned a Swainson's hawk here. Uh, Swainson's hawks we saw quite uh, uh, regularly in the prairie provinces. Uh, uh, this is a juvenile but raised the year before. They uh, hawks maintain the their juvenile plumage until the next full molt in the fall of the, of the of their second calendar year. And here's a lovely adult. Uh, you will remember that uh, Scott Wiedensall spoke to the to the club about uh, to uh, snowy owls last year. Uh, and uh, but he's also he also wrote a book about the Swainson's hawk and the dire straits it was in some years ago when they all migrated to they all migrate to the Pampas of Argentina, and they were finding thousands of them dead from pesticide. The story is a little happier ending. That's all that's come to an end, and I guess it's uh, doing much better now. Just a red-tailed hawk, but I couldn't resist putting this red-tailed hawk in with a Richardson's ground squirrel. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Richardson was was uh, uh, an 18th century naturalist. Uh, uh, Swainson, the one you just saw, the Swainson hawk, he, he wrote the bird section of Richardson's uh, Fauna Boreala of Americas. Another hawk that uh, you want to see in the West is the Ferruginous hawk. As you can imagine, in the short grass prairies, or as you know, in the short grass prairies, there aren't very many nesting trees. So we're driving along. We saw this uh, shed, some kind of maybe a utility shed or that type of thing. And I could see something on top of it. And when we stopped and looked, here was a ferruginous hawk with two chicks. You can only see the one here. Uh, interesting thing about ferruginous hawk, it's very eagle-like and you can see this huge gate, which is diagnostic uh, compared to all our other hawks. It, it, it extends right back to the rear part of the eye. Uh, a few fields away, we saw another ferruginous hawk. This is a dark morph. They appear in that, uh, they can be in that light morph like the, the bird on the nest here, or a dark morph. I suspect this was the mate of the, uh, of, of the bird on the nest. Here's a bird, we, it's rare, you can see it in the Bruce Peninsula, but you know that uh, um, our blackbirds, when they sing in the spring, like grackles uh, and red-winged blackbirds and cowbirds, they all blow themselves up uh, to, as part of their dis display to make themselves look larger and more impressive to a mate. And I was delighted to get this uh, Brewer's blackbird doing the very same thing on a post. I need to warn you that there are a few things other than birds in this presentation. Uh, in southeastern Saskatchewan, we saw this uh, uh, this flower uh, on May the 12th, and you could, it's an early spring flower. It's the first flower to appear on the prairies, and and you can see all the uh, I'll call it fur here, all all of the hairs to to protect it from the frosts and snow that undoubtedly they sometimes it pro probably this year they were. Uh, they were covered with. It's the um, provincial flower, I believe, of uh, Manitoba. Uh, and you can imagine that from early settlers' times to see the first flower of the spring after a Manitoba winter would be a, a, a wonderful experience. They were blooming at a place called Roche Perce, southeast of Estevan, Saskatchewan. Uh, these, these kind of sandstone remnant rocks uh, have been the uh, the object of graffiti by uh, native peoples, cavalrymen, uh, a Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, surveyors, and so on uh, over the years. We didn't see any evidence of it, so it's uh, I guess it's mostly all worn away. Thank goodness for uh, weathering and erosion. Uh, Nighthawks. 
uh, are in the prairies are, are um, you, you can see them on posts like this. They like the short grass prairies for nesting uh, and uh, in, in that regard are commoner than they are here uh, now and, and compared to what they used to be anyway. This here's a bird that, uh, uh, you know, asked, what's your favorite bird? It's certainly one of my most favorite birds, uh, almost uh, uh, not, not just its appearance. When I first started birding, it was had just changed. Its name had just changed from, from Bartramian sandpiper to upland plover. Uh, it's not a plover. So subsequently it was changed to upland sandpiper. A lot of lovely features about it, not least its uh, song. So we spent a lovely June the 20th morning as we were heading back in some native prairie northeast of Weyburn, Saskatchewan. It was full of prairie birds of all kinds, including things like upland sandpipers and shore birds and, and so on. And when we left the native, these patches of native grassland to cultivated land, the bird population dropped off drastically. I'm not suggesting this is a bad thing, uh, at least insofar as human beings are concerned, but it, the, 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 the difference between native grasslands and uh, cultivated grasslands are, are tremendous as far as. And here's another species. This is the Baird's sparrow. Uh, named after Spencer Baird, who was a giant of 19th century ornithology. Think uh, Baird's sandpiper. Uh, its population has been declining drastically uh, because it's an obligate of native grasslands. And it, it's a bit like some of our savannah sparrow here. In fact, you'll even see that in the song, I think. It's a little different, and the bird is uh, for for the bird identifiers. This patch uh, at the, the bottom end of the uh, auriculars is diagnostic, but it looks like a lot of our other uh, large-headed, big-billed uh, grassland sparrows. Gray partridge is almost uh, it's extirpated in the Hamilton study area, as far as we know. Uh, Birders who want to see it in the province now have to go to Ottawa to the experimental farm. There are a few left there. It was introduced to North America. When I started birding, it was called the Hungarian partridge. And then it was changed to European partridge. And finally, it's become the more neutral, I suppose, gray partridge. We saw them in each of the prairie provinces. It's doing a lot better there. I think uh, the soils are too clay-like in our part of the, the world. And the, the young uh, die in the spring if it's a wet spring. There are two gra grassland uh, long spurs, both uh, the, the, the chestnut colored long spur uh, likes tall grass prairies. We found it here as well in southeastern Alberta. Uh, and the somewhat more modestly uh, uh, colored uh, plumaged uh, thick billed long spur. This is the bird that about three or four years ago, the American Ornithologist Society changed the name from McCowan's long spur to thick-billed longspur. The reason, uh, McCowan uh, fought for the Confederacy in the U.S. Civil War and uh, is reputed to have had slaves or advocated slavery. So it was felt that uh, this was not some, somewhat like uh, Ryerson and so on was, uh, um, this, this was not an appropriate name. Uh, interestingly, the place where we saw this bird, you look at eBird maps and you see where the epicenter of some of these birds is. The name that birders have given to the spot where you can see thick-billed long spurs is McCowan's Corners, Alberta. That's lunch on the prairie. You can see that this year there was lots of rain. In fact, I think they've had a rec record rain uh, uh, in the prairies and so on. We we saw lots of rain both coming and going. Today being a nice, the day that this was taken was a nice day, but it's, it's a pleasant uh, place. Not too many, uh, not, not too many flies or, or things uh, this early in the season, Jackson. Western metal arcs. 
You'll hear another bird in the background to test it to see if you know what it is. Much commoner than, uh, than I find eastern meadowlarks to be. Of course, you've got a lot more habitat for a meadowlark in the prairies than, than here. Oh, play that one again. Now, I haven't seen anyone in the chat throw a guess out for that other bird yet. Okay. Well, we'll wait. We'll, we can uh, we can we can reveal its identity if, if anybody wants to know at the end. It's another prairie. Well, I'll give you a hint. It's a prairie sandpiper that, uh, in fact, there might even be a, or did I take it out? I, wanted, I was thinking there was a photo of it here, but maybe not. Anyway, we uh, we came across this in again in southeastern Alberta, spent some time there. Uh, uh, this lovely uh, baby foxes at a den. I think there were three. One of them had just uh, uh, retreated underground, but uh, they are cute, aren't they? Saw so lots of pronghorns. They seem to have adapted both to uh, cultivation and uh, native, uh, well, obviously they've been na native grassland areas, but we saw them in cultivated fields quite a bit in larger numbers than this. I just thought this was a nice, uh, a nice shot. Now we went to about 100 uh, uh, kilometers southwest of Medicine Hat one evening. We'd be given a tip to a patch of grassland, uh, native grassland, where there were burrowing owls. We could not find any burrowing owls. We never saw a burrowing owl. We've seen it before in the prairies, but not this time. But you always see something that uh, that, that that was a wonderful thing to see. We saw a, a plains a garter snake, and then we saw this peacock-like thing heading across a field towards us. And of course you can see what it is, and, uh, but uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen one with a, with a tail spread so spectacularly as, as that. So a lot of different ground squirrels, not gonna show you uh, too many more ground squirrels, if, perhaps not, not anymore, but this one's a real, this is a real cutie, I think. 13 line, because if you start here and count the lines up and across, it, it actually comes to 13. Uh, this was ported near Portage La Prairie early on in the trip. Now, as you know, the prairies are not just uh, uh, fields of grain or uh, uh, areas of native grasses. There are lots of potholes. In this case, this is more than a pothole. This is Frank Lake, uh, south of Calgary. We went, I'm glad we went here. We went here because there had been a report this spring of a Clark's Grebe, a desirable bird if you're a Canadian bird lister. We saw it, but it was uh, out there and we used our telescope and so on. We couldn't get a picture of it. But this lake was just teeming with, uh, I guess in particular birds, the, the noises of birds and birds, birds in, in the passion of early spring. Uh, it's I uh, highly recommend this if you're going out to to the to the prairies. Here's a bird we see here in migration again. Sometimes it's at Windermere Basin and other places, uh, but uh, you don't see it in display like this. Uh, uh, a stunning, stunningly beautiful bird. I think uh, is almost trite to say so, but uh, but it is. There are a number of other birds that uh, in the almost 70 years that I've been looking at birds have changed their status. Uh, the black neck stilt was virtually unknown in Canada for, for most of my birding uh, uh, life. It started to move into uh, the, the prairies and even into southern Ontario, it nested this year at uh, um, near at Strathroy, I think it was, uh, southwest of London. Uh, we saw a few. Uh, it's a lovely addition to our avifauna, I think. It's common through the trop tropical Americas and, and other species in other parts of the uh, of the world as well. And we can also see this in, in Ontario. It's nested in the Hamilton region many years ago, nested once this year at Jarv Jarvis it nested. 
but these are these are female Wilson's phalaropes, and uh, we couldn't get enough of them. Uh, they're such beautiful birds. Another species that uh, was only known from, uh, I think it was Pocoke Lake in southeastern Alberta 40 years ago. And now we saw it two or three times and is found uh, across the prairies in, in suitable habitat. You're seeing, I haven't, I'm not mentioning the names of these necessarily. I think I've labeled them, so it should be okay. Uh, now, the, the, the prairies are a duck factory for, for many species of ducks, and uh, um, most or all of which we see here, but they, they, the males were in uh, breeding finery, as you can see here with this uh, uh, male cinnamon teal. I put the female in, it's out of focus, but it shows the salient features if, if you think you're seeing a, uh, a, a cinnamon teal among blooming teals. It's got a shoveler-like bill. But definitely with a more spatulate here and longer bill and has no white on the front of the face. The white here is a reflection off a wet bill, the sun's reflection, but on a blue winged teal, there's a white patch right in there. Other ducks, again, the species we commonly can see, but they were sputtering and displaying. Uh, I should have got a video, I didn't, but this shows just how spectacular ruddy ducks can be when they're in high dudgeon. And the lake was, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I hope this is loud enough for you to hear, but uh, uh, there were piles of these uh, braying uh, um, yellow-headed blackbirds. Oops, sorry, I'll go back. Do it differently. Uh, let me tell you, if you're right up as we were here, right close to yellow-headed blackbirds, it's almost deafening the, the sound of this, uh, I call it braying. And uh, lots of grebes on these lakes. Uh, um, and notice that they have brilliant red eyes, especially in breeding plumage, but even in the winter, they maintain that, that red eye. But uh, it's interesting, some kind of evolutionary feature that uh, quite a number of grebes have, have uh, brilliant red eyes. Now, I didn't want to leave the prairies without uh, making reference to, uh, and, and this was in Weyburn, uh, to uh, the, the man who was voted in 2000, or in, in six, I think it was, as Canada's greatest Canadian, uh, Tommy Douglas, uh, for his efforts and his spearheading the efforts to to provide us with uh, um, government Medicare. Uh, it was on a side, the statue and so on. We saw a sign, we went down, it was, it was on a side street adjacent to a railroad siding, very unassuming place, which I think is perfect for uh, a, a humble, but great Canadian. Okay, if you're going to the prairies uh, uh, in Western Saskatchewan, it, it bleeds over a little bit into Alberta, the, the Cypress Hills, are a, 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 a must destination, I would say. It's an outlier and has some species from the Rockies, but just, just the scenery uh, and, and other aspects are really spectacular. We stayed at the historic Risa Ranch. You can look it up. It's a great place to stay. It, it, it's all, we stayed in the main house. I don't know whether uh, uh, somewhere up in there, uh, there are a number of rooms and then now they serve, we, we were there in 1998 in July. So we get there this time and we're looking through the uh, the brochures. They have brochures and badges and all kinds of things. There is a bird checklist from Bob Curry and Glendis, Glendis Lesser from July, 1998. Uh, and uh, we could hardly believe it. We told them about this, of course, and then we were kind of feted as celebrities for the two or three days that we were there introduced to people as the bird people and so on. We saw more birds this time because it was uh, June and birds were singing. Uh, 
So you could do a lot worse if you're if you're not a vegetarian. They they raise their own beef cattle. It's a beef. It's a working beef ranch, and and you can have the best steaks you've ever had in your life. We saw two of these, uh, as I say, non-birds, closely related to birds. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, this one, they're, they're both bull snakes or gopher snakes. Somebody, something's got to, besides hawks, have got to eat all those ground squirrels. Uh, this one was in the Okanagan, and this was a beautifully just shed and so brilliantly colored animal on the road uh, as we came into uh, uh, the, the historic research ranch. Now, what, this year, or for the last couple of years, one of the uh, destinations in the Cypress Hills is, is this little bird. It's an Epidinax flycatcher. Uh, formerly, uh, there was the Western flycatcher, and it was split. Some scientists decided that it, it was deemed differently enough based on its vocalizations and some other features to split it from. And now there's the Pacific Slope flycatcher and the Cordilleran flycatcher. And the Cordilleran uh, this bird was found, a pair of birds was found here a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago now. We had excellent uh, uh, information from, from my friend Chris Escott of Toronto and from our own Alvin Buckley gave me detailed directions as to where to find this bird. We went there on a gray uh, overcast day, went to the spot, looked across the creek and there it was and here it is. Uh, Maybe the only valid ones in Canada because the ones to the west are deemed to be hybrids with uh, the Pacific Slope flycatcher. Okay, the Rockies. Again, I'm going to combine our way out and our way back. Uh, bears to say that this was the first time I'd ever seen the Rockies. Uh, um, uh, one of the main reasons for going, of course, I've seen the I've seen the Rockies in the states and the Andes in South America, but not the, not our own Canadian Rockies. And uh, twice through was not nearly enough. I could show you a whole set of scenery shots. I could spend the whole 40 minutes looking at uh, showing you pictures. This is Lake Louise. I always thought Lake Louise was an aquamarine lake, uh, serene waters and so forth. But if you arrive on a cold spring uh, in May, this is what it looked like when we were there. A um, few birds. Uh, we saw these in the Okanagan, but in, in, in the Rockies as well. And, and this, we see these from time to time or almost, almost annually uh, 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 along the lake, especially the drakes, which are fairly easy to tell. Females are much more difficult. And I took this photo, uh, which shows the salient features, mostly the head features. There's a little bit of, of white differences in the wing, almost completely orange yellow bill, shorter and stubbier than on a, uh, um, common golden eye, a head with a very steep forehead like that, and more of a, a of a tail out the back of the head, a rough out the back of the head. And the color is a little more chocolate brown. It, uh, if I may say so, this, this is a very nice photo illustrating the identification features of uh, Barrow's golden eye. So I went to Banff. Did some of the things that tourists do there, including that Lake Louise picture you saw. Um, this is Bow Falls, famous falls. Uh, and there were, when we went there, there were a lot of uh, tourists taking pictures and selfies and so on. I don't think, I suspect nobody else there knows that this was the, uh, the falls that uh, Robert Mitchum and Marilyn Monroe went over in the 1950s film, River of No Return. Moreover, they also don't know that this is a spot for the dipper. Of all the dozens of people they're taking pictures, we are quite confident we're the only ones that saw this bird, which was right virtually at their feet, as you can see. It's a bit of a jinx bird for us. We, uh, uh, this is the only one we saw. I mean, you don't look just as hard for birds once you've, once you've seen them. But nonetheless, we went to a lot of places like this spectacular Athabasca Falls, and there's a plaque there saying, look for the dipper. Well, we never saw them anywhere else except that one. Not complaining, mind you. Um, we saw magpies from Ontario right across the West. It's a, it's a corvid and of course has learned how to uh, utilize humans and their structures and their food sources and so on. Uh, 
And here's another corvid, the Clark's nutcracker. This was at Banff coming to be fed and so forth. With the place to see these almost always seems to be in campgrounds or next to restaurants or places like that because they know which side their bread is buttered on. This was uh, northeast of, um, I'm just gonna check here, uh, Kamloops, no, northeast of Kamloops. I, I went out along a road, I think Glenda had decided to, to stay in for an hour uh, and uh, saw this animal for a second, wasn't sure what it was, realized what it was, and I didn't have my camera. I broke the cardinal rules always. So I backed off slowly, scuttled back to the car, couple of hundred meters back. I came back, it was still there, the silver fox. Uh, it's, a, it's a red fox, but uh, they occur, I guess they can occur even more, and you can tell the diagnostic uh, tail with the white, uh, the white tip to it. Uh, it can be jet black, but this, this was a very impressive and, and lovely animal. Uh, near Banff, I remember I was talking about uh, sapsuckers, and we'll come back to sapsuckers, but uh, in one uh, um, park woodlot at Banff, we had all three of these species of uh, chickadees. And of course, you had black cap to that, so we saw four species of chickadees on the trip. Um, this is near, uh, and we're going out in near Revelstoke. It was cold, and I went out with a local birder, and he took took me to some spots where ponds and so on. Here were Vox's swifts. Uh, when I was younger, I thought for sure that it should be called Vaux's swift, but at Townsend, the Townsend of Townsend Solitaire, and you'll see that uh, named it after a Philadelphia mineralogist uh, friend of his named Vox. Uh, there are some slight differences from chimney swift. It looks like they look like chimney swift, but uh, you can see it uh, that it's lighter on the upper breast and on the rump. Now, uh, whether you could pull that out of a flock of chimney swifts, uh, nobody has yet done so in Ontario. It's not to say it won't happen. Um, this is on the way back through the Rockies. We we went the north northern route through Jasper, and this is looking down at the town site of Jasper. We love these CN trains, these long, long trains with brightly colored cars and uh, with uh, very creative graffiti on many of them. I mean, they're quite a sight to, to see uh, rolling through towns and along uh, railroad lines in, in the West. We'd seen a couple of uh, mangy elk south of Calgary, and we were kind of disappointed, but when we got to Jasper, we found that the, the Wapiti, our uh, American elk, was fairly common in and around town. They, uh, they warn you about them. Uh, they say they can be more dangerous than grizzlies. We saw this grizzly. Grizzlies in Jasper are, you know, people, there are a lot of people there, tourists there, uh, even at that time, he was quite cool, quite cold, in fact. Uh, but one of the big highlights is to see a grizzly. And as soon as one is seen along the road, within, I'll say, seconds, but certainly minutes, there's a lineup of parked cars there. And there's a ranger there comes comes up and says, please get back in your, do not leave your cars. And and also with the other hand is, is playing a loud noisemaker to scare the bear away. It's a bit of a circus, but it's not a zoo. It is a wild animal. So we were we were pleased to see it, uh, I guess, better than having staring one down on a, on a trail, a nature trail by yourself. One of the main reasons for to go to Jasper was we wanted to go up the Sky Tram. I had asked uh, uh, Bruce DeLabio, uh, a, uh, well, he's formerly from Ottawa and a good friend of mine for many years, where might we see uh, white-tailed ptarmigan. He said, well, the best place to go is to go take the sky tram above Jasper. And here we are taking it up. It's raining and misty down in the, in the valley. And up the top, you see you're up above the uh, uh, tree line into alpine tundra. There it was on, just let me tell you the date here, uh, if I have it still, June the 14th, June the 14th in Jasper. 
uh, every piece of clothing we had, we were wearing uh, because it was like that. And this is looking back, you've come up the far side of that, that's the terminal, the terminus, uh, still snow up in, the, in this alpine tundra. And looking the other way as you walk out, uh, lots of snow. And uh, we walked these trails back and forth, looking, listening, and so on, until finally we saw our quarry, the willow ptarmigan, or pardon me, the white-tailed ptarmigan. Look at the uh, snow. It was windy, uh, almost a gale blowing, and snow, and so on, and uh, uh, how appropriate, I suppose. This is uh, a white-tailed ptarmigan halfway from its all-white winter plumage to its all-brown summer plumage. And here's how close we were able to get to it. Uh, so Bruce de Laville came through with, with uh, flying colors, as did the bird flying colors. Also here, we found three little mouse-like creatures. Didn't have very many birds up there, as you can imagine. It's called the Whistler because it's named after the hoary marmot, which uh, we didn't see because they're not, they, they wouldn't, no respecting hoary marmot would show about itself above ground until uh, the summer came. I think they're only out for about two months. Uh, anyway, we found three gray-crowned rosy finches skulking along through the, uh, the vegetation trying to find the uh, last year's seeds. Well, I think it is finding last year's seeds if you look at it. And what a horrible time we had in the Rockies. Uh, uh, no, no pleasure, no creature comforts whatsoever, as you can see in this photograph. On to BC. Uh, this is uh, Merritt, BC, and I took a few photos, mostly from the cars we were driving of these horrible, the evidence of the year before us, uh, horrible uh, wildfires, forest fires. A couple of shots just to show you the, the, uh, the immensity of it all. Uh, not much to say about it. Uh, what can you say except, uh, I mean, in, it, to some extent, it's a natural phenomenon. It's a question of how much there was uh, uh, that particular year. And I guess it even carries on to today. So we got to the West Coast. We spent five days on the West Coast uh, uh, and to enjoy its uh, uh, art galleries, its restaurants, and its natural beauty. And as well as the beauty of all through uh, Vancouver, we were there at the height of rhododendrons and azaleas and other flowering. There was a riot of colors. I mean, you think of it all, and, and like a True naturalist, I haven't taken any pictures of, uh, which I should have done, of uh, rhododendrons and other garden flowers because it all looks green here, but especially on the Vancouver side. Well, even in West Vancouver, down among the houses, there were tremendous uh, gardens, beautiful, beautiful gardens with flowers everywhere. This is looking from uh, West Vancouver, or you can see Stanley Park here. I've got it labeled up there. This is Stanley Park here, and there's the city in behind it. Here's the industrial site. I'm telling you this because the next scene, this is the next day from, from uh, Stanley Park, looking across Burrard Inlet to these sulfur piles. And I think there's beauty there. So does Edward Bertinsky in his iconic photographs of man's pollution and industrial activities. Uh, so that's my attempt to be Edward Bertinsky. If you look down between in the in the water, you might see uh, other, uh, pelagic cormorants. They have double-crested cormorants, but they have a couple of other brants and pelagic. This is the smallest of the three with a fine bill, and like quite a few cormorants, ha has patches of white on it in in breeding plumage. In the in the uh, uh, Stanley Park itself, and there's a, a marshy open area in the middle where we saw Anna's hummingbird. Uh, I'm told, well, Christine Bishop tells me that there are uh, they're the commonest hummingbird now in uh, Vancouver and Victoria and so forth. They've adapted to gardens and feeders and so on so so well. In the rain in Stanley Park, there's the counterpart of our rose petty grosbeak. And also there, the counterpart of our uh, blue jay. Uh, I mean, the, the other one always, you know, our blue jay is a lovely bird. 
when, when you don't see these very often, you think this is better, but it's not better. It's just a, another lovely bird. Uh, we saw these a few times. Birders, you say, how can you tell a Western wood peewee from uh, uh, an Eastern? Well, you can't really tell it uh, easily in any way based on its uh, appearance. You can tell it's a peewee. It's got these very long wings extending beyond the uh, secondaries and tertials. Uh, way down, halfway down the tail. But if you hear it, you can tell. I think that it's a peewee, uh, but it doesn't. You would, you would know that wasn't a peewee. That was more clear uh, without the burr and without that uh, upslur of uh, western wood peewee. We saw a few of those. Oops, next. Uh, this is Lighthouse Park in West Vancouver. It's as far out as you can go on the north side of Burrard Inlet, uh, at least in West Vancouver. And it's a lovely park. I won't call it an urban park, but it, it's it's uh, it's heavily visited. But it's, it's a rainforest. Uh, everything is running amok. At this time of year, there are slime molds, fungi, Ferns. So, uh, Glenda said, if you stood still for ten minutes, something would start to grow on you. You know, and they just uh, she found it a bit intimidating. It was so so much like that. Uh, uh, certainly, a riot of, of growth and, and and burgeoning life. But we did see bush tit there. Only one we saw. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a bird that only occurs in southern Vancouver Island and in the bank in the uh, Lower Mainland. Uh, um, found all through the states, western states, but but not nowhere else in Canada. We you go up McGill, you, you go up um, to, to Cypress Park, Cypress Provincial Park uh, on the North Shore, we, uh, to look for uh, some specialty birds. We went back to winter up there. We went up to the top uh, uh, looking for uh, 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 sooty grouse. We heard sooty grouse, couldn't photograph them. But while we were uh, hearing one and trying to see it, uh, we saw this McGillivray's warbler, a close relative of the morning warbler. Uh, it, I think Audubon named uh, this after uh, a, a McGillivray who was deemed to be the first ecologist. I don't know quite why, but the first ecologist uh, uh, was the first one given that name. And there's Audubon, him, Audubon's warbler. Uh, might be split, you know. Was there was one time there was Audubon's warbler and Myrtle warbler, and then they were lumped into Yellow Rump warbler. And it may be that Audubon's warbler, lovely bird, isn't it? Might well be split again. One of the birds you want to see at Cyprus uh, is the is another sapsucker, this stunning red-breasted sapsucker. Only time we saw it, one morning, only place. You really kind of got to go to uh, the North Shore in uh, 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 North Vancouver and up Cypress Park and a couple of other parks in order to see this. It occurs a few other places, but that's where you go if you want to see it. On the way back down, uh, we had another bear experience. Came up over a slope and there was a feeding black bear. So I took a couple of photos and then back we backed off slowly until we were certain it couldn't see us and then uh, moved a little more quickly away from it. This is a bird, uh, two or three, I think about three years ago, we were out on the West Coast to do a pelagic trip and we spent a whole day in the rain unsuccessfully looking for California scrub jay and didn't look any better this year. Uh, but because uh, I looked at the uh, Discord for Vancouver, uh, and there were there was one report said it was on private property. Uh, so I talked to Melissa Hafting, who's a, a birding information guru and birder uh, in, in Vancouver, and she said, "No, you can't see it." And then a day or two later, she texted or, or emailed, I forget which, uh, and said, "I I know the streets it's on in Abbotsford, and uh, you can go there." Or, uh, so, but don't go off the sidewalks. And so we walked around, we went, drove out there, drove around for, or walked around for uh, an hour or two. And finally, the California J, Scrub J showed itself. So two days.
worth it. Also, there were Buicks wrens, a bird that we don't have anymore. We used to occasionally get uh, one eastern ones, but uh, uh, in Ontario, rarely. But uh, there were Buicks wrens there. Now, the last part, the part we spent the most time in was the Okanagan. Uh, uh, my friend George Bryant said that he's been all over the world. He said it's his favorite place to uh, uh, look for birds in the world, not, not least because of the spectacular scenery. We stayed in an Airbnb, a house down here for two weeks. You know, we've been on the road for this time for uh, uh, more than four weeks. So we stayed down here in an Airbnb and went to birdied up in the hills up and behind it here, went up the valley that way and up the valley behind us here, behind this tree up up in here and saw most of the birds that, that, that we wanted to see and recovered from being on the road all that time. We could bird until early afternoon and then relax in the, in the sunshine. It was cool, but not, uh, and thoroughly enjoyed this most beautiful part of Canada. A, a dooryard bird right around there's the California quail that, that was introduced to, uh, to BC many, many years ago and is highly successful and is a nice neighbor to have. It's a great sound to have around uh, uh, where you live. Uh, I mean, this this the Sage Phoebe is arguably my, my the the bird I enjoyed the most in the West. It's like our Eastern Phoebe, like a to be anthropomorphic, a softer, gentler version of of the uh, Eastern Phoebe. Its calls are more muted. Its colors are. Well, I guess they're not more muted than a Phoebe, but uh, I just like this bird. And, and there were a couple right around the house we stayed and the male would fly. I didn't know they did this. It flew way up into the air and did circle skylark like flew around uttering soft, uh, it's soft uh, nuptial song, I would say. This is a, a, it's called on the maps, I think it's called McIntyre Bluff. But it's it's at the south end of Basu Lake, and it's one of the mo the, the most spectacular uh, uh, landscapes in in Canada. I, I think you'd have to say uh, this is its uh, uh, Nick Mip, uh, uh name. Uh, Nylon tin. Uh, they used to live in the valley. Uh, Europeans objected to the the fact that they couldn't get at the richest part of the valley, and so the Nick Mip, uh, were moved upslope. Nonetheless, they've done very well. They, they, we went to the First Nation to, to see birds and to go to their restaurant. They have campgrounds, they have uh, uh, grapes, and uh, our own Christine Bishop has uh, worked with them to preserve uh, uh, Western rattlesnake habitat and the yellow-breasted chat, Western chat habitat and so forth. So they're involved in every part of life in that part, and they have several of these quite spectacular sculptures uh, on their on their property. Uh, you just I put the cursor here by this wolf that's uh, uh, been cut out of the neck of this uh, of this statue. A few mountain goats, not very close. That picture is not too sharp because uh, it was way up the slope. So you're looking along those cliffs, such as uh, we saw a second ago here, like that, and there are mountain goats, and way up uh, from those cliffs, you can hear this. Nope, oh, thought it would twice, but maybe not. Anyway, there it goes. Wait for it, wait for it, as they say. Uh, this is a photograph I took of, of one in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico some years ago, uh, because again, it was way up the cliff and you couldn't get a photograph. Another bird that, uh, in the same place, so you're looking up the cliffs, you're hearing uh, canyon wrens, uh, seeing goats, and overhead in the blue skies are white-throated swifts that just make it into Canada uh, in the Okanagan. 
uh, and then if you look down at eye level, right across there's uh, uh, the Western representative of the Western relative of the indigo bunting, this lovely lazuli bunting singing away. And then on the slopes, gambling around are this uh, kind of Western groundhog, the yellow-bellied marmot, a bit bigger than our groundhog and, and, and beautifully pelaged. Now at, at Osoyoos, if you go up to the uh, up into the hills, on this, there's a, a road with a beautiful name of Kilpula Road, and it's a spectacular road for the naturalist. The first part of it goes through some ranch houses and there are places with the bird feeders uh, where and hummingbird feeders in particular at this time of year where you can see uh, things like this lovely Rufus. I have a quote. I, I read a book, just, just finished reading a book called Peace Talks by Tim Finch. And he describes hummingbirds that, he, that he's seen in the West Indies. He's not, he's not writing about nature at all, but he says, the hummers dart and dock a kinetic blur of needle point beak, pin boned wing and iridescent coat. I, I've never heard a better description of hummingbirds. Three species here, the, the smallest bird to, to nest in Canada, the calliope hummingbird. And the least common here was the black chinned hummingbird. Something else at this place, we went there twice. The man liked to talk, but he was very, as I say, he was generous. We could stay and, and look at the hummingbird. We were just about to leave the second time. I guess he got a sense that I was interested in things other than birds. And he said, you know, I've got rubber boas. And I said, what? Well, apparently he, he said, the story is he moved in 10 years ago, found out that under this, this uh, concrete pad of this uh, uh, workshop, there, were, there was a rubber boa hibernaculum. And so he built this structure because he noticed they came out here to sun in the spring and I presume in the fall before they, before they uh, hibernate for, for the winter. So he built this so that they would be protected from him, from his whippersnipper or any other activity that he might do. It's very amazingly thoughtful, don't you think? Anyway, we, we saw three there. They're a little hard to see. You couldn't be, would it be nice to pick up this animal? But uh, there you can see its eye and the large scales of its nose. They're, they're kind of fossorial, spent a lot of time underground, but, but a good sized animal as well. This is, that might be a second one there, but we said there were three here, but this is one of them right here. I was thrilled, I have to tell you. Also up the Kilpula Road, this is an ambistomus salamander, the same as our Jefferson's and uh, spotted salamander. Uh, I occasionally flip things, but I'm always careful to put them back the way, the way I found them and, and saw a couple of these lovely northern long-toed salamanders. Butterflies were just coming out towards the end of our stay, lovely Ackman blue. I'm gonna speed things up just a little here because I, I note that we're uh, running uh, along. Little story here. I wanted to see the uh, the Mount Lady, Lady Slipper, Cypripedia montanum. I looked an eye naturalist, found us. Uh, th there are a few there, but the only one I could find fairly decent uh, directions for was in a a a stream river actually running through uh, uh, Kelowna. We went there. It's right in the city. Had to park in a city parking lot, walk down the trail. And damn, did we didn't find the single plant that he had reported from the previous year. And I got down on my belly to photograph it. And there were people on walk, dog walkers, cyclists and everything going past. Not one person stopped and said, what are you doing? Or what are you looking at? That was, we was quite, <laughs> it was quite shocking actually. West, west of Asoyus, we, uh, uh, we found an eBird report that there was long bill curly there and we hadn't gone to Grasslands Park. Uh, lovely bird. Other thing this bird got us onto was the, I wanted to tell you about this. This, where is it here? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we found the, a restaurant called the Road 14 Restaurant. I think it's named uh, uh, Clippers Organic Farm and Cidery is the other name for it. And it's it's only been open a couple of years and it's in the top 10 restaurants in Vancouver. People come out all the way from Vancouver for the day and it's organic food and you eat what they prepare for that meal. There were only a few people there still 
early in the season, and it was spectacular. I think this is the third, um, uh, the third sap sucker I've showed you, the red nape sap sucker. Uh, and wait for it, there's the fourth. This one was a bit of a jinx. It took us uh, uh, three, four trips to, to two places to see it, but we finally saw two different ones here, as you can see. It's the hardest one of the sap suckers, and, and that's the four species that occur in Canada. Uh, Cassis finches. Uh, uh, there's our purple finch taken on the same trip. There's the Cassis finch. Uh, there are differences to be seen. Uh, this has got streaks under the uh, in the vent area under under tail coverts. Purple finch doesn't. The streaks are more incisive and darker in all parts. There, I could spend more time on, but I won't. You could see this at a feeder. Somebody will at some point see it at a feeder in Ontario, I think. No words need, needed for, for this bird, he thinks. Few Western bluebirds, you'd have to look, you know, it takes more than a glance. They've got the uh, rufous on the back. The male would have more than this, this female uh, and, and a blue throat. And the whole color of the that blue, to, to my mind, is a different shade of blue than on uh, our eastern bluebird. And there we, I showed you Clark's uh, nutcracker before. Here's the other one of the explorers, the explorer pair, Lewis's woodpecker. We only saw a couple. Whoop, whoop, sorry. Go back. Got to be careful you don't touch your keyboard. Violet green swallow, like our tree swallow, but seem to prefer more, more wooded areas than the uh, tree swallow. The Cassin's finch is the equivalent. There are a lot of birds, of course, that are equivalent of uh, another, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Eastern form. This is the equivalent of the blue-headed vireo. It used to be all just called solitary vireo. Now it's, you know, it's, uh, it's Plumbius vireo, the Cassin's vireo here. Song slightly different. The plumage is more muted. Pretty bird, you hear it far more than you see it. Now here's the here's the test of uh, what you think is the Western tanager or the Scarlet tanager the more spectacularly beautiful. Your choice. We saw great gray owls at one spot. Uh, we were told about where they were. They weren't on they weren't on the list serves because uh, because it's a protected species or it's an endangered species. They would fly out into this hay field, catch voles. Here's one looking for a vole to fly out, hover, catch a vole, and flew back into the woods to feed. You could hear a begging young back in there. We only saw a couple of bullocks or orioles. They're not, they don't seem to be as common as Baltimore orioles. We saw a few of this lovely gentle thrush, which is seen annually in Ontario now, the town's in solitaire. All these, all these, uh, birds that were named in the 18th century were named after people. I don't have a problem with that. They, there's a whole history to those people. Uh, this is Brewer Sparrow. It's the same genus as Chipping Sparrow and Field Sparrow. Uh, and uh, it, was in a, it was in a sparrow reserve up the Kelpula Road. And uh, that would be uh, confirmed breeding. And so with this, a Western Kingbird with nesting material. We had a lot of trouble seeing dusky grouse. We went to the same spot about three times and I'm doing walking all over the place, uh, walking up under the trees and so on. And thank goodness for cell phones because Glenda texted me and said, grouse on the road. So I came running back down the road, saw it on the road and then off into the bushes it went. Uh, there are a bunch of West, a bunch of Impidinax flycatchers in the West. All you need to do is look at this to learn how to identify them all. Just kidding. But there are three, partly by vocalization, partly by uh, wing structure and so forth. Uh, those are three. So we had the, the Cordillerian flycatcher that I showed you earlier, the Hammonds, the Gray, and the Dusky. Gray's nest in the Okanagan. Hammonds, Hammonds and Dusky are more widespread. One of the best birds of the trip was the lesser goldfinch. The second last day, a friend in the West uh, had, uh, I called to tell him about the, the rubber boas because he'd never seen one. He's a naturalist uh, and uh, field biologist and so on. Anyway, he said, you know, you might want to try, uh, and he gave us a spot to try 
where he'd had lesser goldfinch in 2019 and 2020, hadn't looked in 2021. We went there in 2022, our last day in the Okanagan, and there it was. Very exciting. Now I'm going to end up with a few flowers because I to tell you, the flowers in the Okanagan were spectacular. We couldn't have gone at a better time of year. I'm sure in the summertime, it's desiccated and dry. And here are three or four flowers. These were all over when we when we uh, got there. By the time we left, their their flowering was over. This this the native people used the the, the roots. They dug up the roots in the early spring when there was nothing else left to eat, and they could eat those. Look, looks quite cactus like, don't you think? And there is the last. As a, we went out west to see birds, but we saw Canada in all its beauty, its landscapes. We chatted with people all over. They were, all, you know, you watch the news and you think we're, we think this between between forest fires and storms and political infighting and people protests and so on. But we had a wonderful time with Canada and Canadians. Thank you so much. So Jackson, um, yeah, you can take over. I'm going to stop sharing your screen. Um, wonderful, wonderful recap of your trip. I've got a few questions, and I usually ask a few to let folks have a chance to put their questions in the Q&A as well, um, because there will undoubtedly be a few folks wanting to share a few things. Uh, Sylvia said, beautiful photos. Um, a few other comments that weren't quite questions. Uh, Marianne McDougal, I love that Bob included Tommy Douglas. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was that was a neat slide there. Chris Motherwell, I think, said, um, "Is the call on the Western Meadowlark slide a long-billed curlew?" No, oh, it's close. It's a willet. A willet. 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 Say their name. Pill. Will. Willet. Pill. Will. Willet. Pill. Will. Willet. It's onomatopoeic. That's how it got its name. Gotcha. I didn't know that. Um, so from the day you left to the day you came home, how long was that trip? 57 days. 57 days. Yeah, we wanted to do it. Uh, we planned it last year while we both could spend that long in a car. I don't mean with, with one another. I meant just our own health, you know. <laughs> yeah, of course. It, yeah. Um, 57 days, and, and one thing I noticed that was kind of a running theme throughout your presentation was what I'll call the value of community. You seemed to mention names of folks you would reach out to to ask questions or to or or to get some citing information from. Yeah. Um, so how much planning and research in, in minutes or hours um, did, did, did you find yourself or you and Glenda doing before you left? Well, I, uh, I I I went to eBird Maps for all the species that uh, that I wanted to to see, and uh, you can go to Species Maps and you can see the bullets where they are, and uh, so I and then so every species I would have a page in a notebook and say these are the two or three best places to see this bird, and then and, and so on. So yeah, it took quite a while, but I mean it's a labor of love, of course. Yeah, I mean the only bird, interestingly. The only bird that would have, we saw most of the birds that I wanted to see, New Canada birds, 25 or something, I think. Uh, Northern pygmy owl, I've never seen or heard anywhere. And that's the only one that, that, that we didn't see. So the only one that would have been a life bird, not, not just a Canada bird. But anyway, it's kind of ironic, I thought. That, anyway. Wow. So the you said the northern pygmy owl would have been would it have been? Do you think other than maybe like a vagrant, would that have been the only lifer on your on your like target list? That's right. Wow. That's right. And and we we should have, we could have seen it. Uh, people say uh, they they're they're diurnal, at least partly diurnal, if not. And and so you you can play if you play the song, quite often they'll answer. But. Uh, we played it a few times, didn't work, so. Gotcha. Um, so Dina um, had asked that question in the Q&A. What bird species did you miss? Was there any other 
uh, than that that you were hoping for, whether or not it was a lifer or a Canadian bird? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, would you say you had a top sighting? You mentioned a few birds. With rubber the, boa. The, pardon? <laughs> rubber boa. <laughs> uh, uh, birds, I don't know. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. I guess because we'd spent a whole day looking for California scrub jay and missed in the rain and got soaked and cold. And this time, didn't look like we were going to see it. And then Melissa sent me an email, said, I've got you the address for this bird, but don't go in the, on their property. That whole story, uh, I think, made it a special bird. Yeah. Gotcha. Great. Um, two questions are kind of similar, and I'll ask them both separately. So George Naylor said, that was a pretty comprehensive trip you and Glenda undertook. Was there a place you wanted to get to and didn't? Or was there something you wanted to see that you did? on which is a reason to do it again so kind of a two-part question well uh, as i say grasslands national park uh, uh, uh we did not get there and it was a weather thing we could have on the way back but you know once you it's like the horse in the and the barn uh, uh you know once you turned and head for home we didn't spend just as much time uh so that was that was a place that we really would like to have gone to and we've never been to the sand hills of saskatchewan there's some great big sand hills in, in north central saskatchewan uh yeah that'd be another place to go i'd, I'd go out to uh, uh regina or yeah probably Re i'd fly out and go to grasslands park and spend a week there it's it's a wonderful place um great and then um an anonymous attendee asks how did you find all the great spots to go like the natural prairie areas uh sometimes uh they're they're named on on maps uh sometimes if you go by the baird sparrow i uh, i looked i said well they got a bunch of baird sparrows along this road and we went there and didn't realize it until we got there or should have i guess that it was natural prairie northeast of Weyburn, Saskatchewan. So sometimes just by, you know, a friend of mine is going out, he and his wife are going out west next year and they want to know where to go for butterflies. And I said, well, I just look for butterflies at the same places. If, if they're natural areas and they're good for birds, they're probably going to be good for butterflies. So yeah, you go to the, go to the parks, go to the natural areas. The more natural, the better. Awesome. Uh, George Bryant asked, superb pictures. Which camera did you use? I just used my uh, uh, Nikon Coolpix. Uh, yeah, same one that I, uh, yeah, George knows that camera. Yeah, yeah, I think he's got one. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, Dale says, great presentation. Um, great one and a half. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe that's an inside joke. It took and too long. Then, and then Dale wonders, where is Bob and Glenda's next bird trip? I will put myself up for adoption and they can take <laughs> me with them. Well, we're slowing down a bit, but we're going to uh, Guatemala in February for a couple of weeks and staying at one uh, one bird lodge. Uh, looks like looks like it's going up in the hills. Looks like it's going to be a nice place. Awesome. Yeah. Guatemala. Mm -hmm. um, that looks like most of the questions in the Q&A over in the chat. Uh, Sheena says, beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I had, I guess, more of a question that uh, was a little less to do about your trip and, and something a bit more closer to home. Um, you know, we at the top, you know, I mentioned the, 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 the prevalence of fish crows in the Hamilton study area. Uh, you had mentioned the Cassin's finch would likely be something that would show up at a feeder uh, in the, in the area. What can you say? What, what kind of comments can you make about bird ranges that you might that 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 younger birders or folks in the next ten or fifteen years might notice a, a shift in uh, in our particular area of Canada? Well, I, if the same trends continue that uh, that I pointed out, such as some of these. Uh, black neck stilts and uh, white faced ibis and and, uh, and so on moving north. I think we, we might well find Kentucky warblers and worm eating warblers uh, and, and some of these and summer tanagers and blue grosbeaks nesting in southern Ontario in the next uh, 10 or 15 years. That, that northward movement, I mean, they can move faster than vegetation, but the, I think they, they'll find areas suitable. 
Um, anything that any predictions you can make about birds that we're seeing these days? Do you keep up with the the trends of of bird populations? You know, those that are suffering and those that are abundant. Well, I mean, I just read. I notice and I read what other people do, and that is that the big birds seem to be doing really well. Uh, birds of prey seem to be doing really well, uh, but uh, yeah, the other birds that, you know, I'm not telling you anything that you haven't had speakers on before about aerial insectivores and, and so on. I, you know, I, I anecdotally, uh, we used to see a lot more birds when 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 I went birding, no, you know, I was a lot more active. You know, it's it's not it's just a simple thing. I don't look as hard now. My faculties aren't just as good as they were. But 40, 50 years ago, we saw big numbers of some birds that we don't don't see now. Any any examples you can give? Well, just in migration, uh, quite often at Long Point, there would be thousands of of spare you know sometimes i put old checklists into ebird and they keep getting flagged they say this is a large number but so i always put down was much commoner in the 1970s what else can i say <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um i mean like to that point you you must you know in seeing in seeing the advancements in technology um you know is is there anything that is surprising you these days about where science is taking the world in terms of, of birding or even uh, in terms of the naturalist communities? Well, I think the, uh, ironically, I think there are fewer birds and the statistics show it. And I mean, these worldwide populations, but as a, a birder, you can you can see more species of birds nowadays because of the technology, because there's so many of us. There are rare birds turning up all the time, almost daily. That and and people are documenting them with their cameras. You know, one time uh, it, it would have been harder to break into that uh, that inner group that said, "Oh, you couldn't have seen that. You can't possibly have seen that." But no, it was like like the young woman, at least the woman who photographed the kittiwake on the beach. You, I mean, no, you can't see a, an adult kittiwake on the beach. <laughs> well, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, w w winding down here, the, the questions the questions have have ceased on the uh, on the Q and A. Uh, Sylvia said, "Are ravens expanding their range? You've been noticing more ravens flying over our area close to the lake. I saw crows chasing a pair of ravens. Any thoughts on that?" Well, all the corvids are doing well. It's another group. Ravens have uh, uh, have moved south from uh, uh, they you know, when they used to poison uh, bait wolves and so on. Ra ra uh, ravens were knocked right back way up into the north and uh so they've moved south fish crows have moved in uh yeah we used to have uh, one one uh, uh black corvid here the american crow now we have three that are relatively common uh, uh, you, you can see ravens uh, if you really want to almost any day and fish crows if you go about you know in certain places along the lake so yeah they're all they're all increasing corvids blue jays seem to be doing well i guess well west nile didn't uh they they recover from that amazingly quickly, I think. Yeah, um, I I know that that there was a, I thought I saw a confirmed case of West Nile in, in Hamilton this year, but I could be wrong. Um, so can I ask you a personal question? Do you have a favorite um, location locally that you like to um, bird? Well, I used to look really like Woodland Cemetery in uh, spring and fall migration, but I don't get over there so much anymore. And but some people do. Andrew McTavish is there regularly. You are there and so on. So uh, that's one of the best places for seeing act birds actively migrating. I really like that kind of thing. And yeah, I used to like years ago. Here's an interesting thing. We got these huge mudflats out at Dundas Marsh, Coots Paradise, uh, and Princess Point and so on. There's hardly any shorebirds on them. <laughs> there used to be, I, I don't know whether it's because the sewage treatment plant is now so, but but other parts of Ontario, they're seeing godwits and long-billed dowagers and so on. We're, we're not seeing them. But this time of year, we used to see three, four, five thousand Dunlin on the marsh. Wow. I've seen one this year. Mind you, I haven't looked as hard as many, but I don't know why, what's the matter with the, what, to those mudflats, why there's no food in them. Have you seen shorebirds out there? Yeah, there was, I, I sent, um, 
I sent Marcus Legsdens and and probably someone else a, a video. I went at sunset down to the Marshwalk Lookout Tower and I and I looked east, and there was a train of shorebirds that there had to have been a, a hundred plus, all just kind of walking in a line. Oh yeah. And but they were they were just far enough away, and the light was so poor that that we couldn't really make out any ID on them. Yeah. Um, but that was, that was, you know, a good, uh, I guess, I guess I can look up the video to, to, to remember when that might've been. Um, but, and I, so I've been finding that there are, are smaller pockets of them. When I've been finding shorebirds, they're tucked into debris. Uh, they're sleeping tucked in against the wood. So when you scan with your binoculars, you're not really seeing them, but then you get the scope and then you start scanning for those, for the driftwood, they're sleeping in and among that. Yeah, so um, they're maybe just stopping and they're not, they're not probing in the mud. They're not building up in numbers. There can't be a lot of food out there in those flats. I, I, I guess not. I mean, there've been, there've been handfuls of the, of the greater and lesser yellow leg hmm. um, that we've seen through there, of course. Um, uh, Valley Inn did get a tremendous amount of shorebirds, pro maybe more so than than Coots Paradise, um, but maybe yeah, there's just because there are more folks there. Um, yeah, Heather said we were we were paddling on Coots September 10th. There were reasonably good numbers then, not thousands though. Yeah. Um, and Marianne McDougal said I saw yellow legs at Water Edge at the RBG. So there there were handfuls, but yeah, uh, not big numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, that trend of I I. I've got a platform here. I, I think all the people out there with cameras, you know, birders kind of used to resent, oh, they're just photographers. I think it's wonderful. They're out there. They're not killing birds. They're out there taking pictures uh, and, and they're having fun. Uh, I think it's great to see all those photographers out and about uh, at, uh, at uh, Valley Inn is a place where you can see dozens of photographers. I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing that I I heard recently is that the the mud flats, sorry, the the water levels in the marsh are a foot lower than seasonal. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what that says for the life that could be in that water. Um, yeah, but well, you know, like yeah, run, know. running into Liam Thorne and Marcus down there, they were they were the ones that were submitting the five hundred plus uh, waterfowl. So they're working their way through. It looks like those little waterfowl are working their way through the teal and whatnot. Yeah. Um, they're picking through the, a bit deeper spots than the shorebirds. Could. I don't know. I don't know. It just seems seems strange. I, I mean, the whole, the total number of shorebirds is down as well. I mean, they're sure. so that's part of it. I mean, the potential. Anyway, um, the last question I'll ask you. Um, the, 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 sorry, one comment I'll make is that um, I'd love to also hear from Glenda at some point too. Uh, you know how how what what really excited her about the trip that you went on. Um, you know, like the Bob Curry is is known throughout the world, but Glenda is by your side through and through. Um, so tell Glenda I'm going to pick her brain a little bit down the road at some point. Sure, she might be uh, watching. She might be watching it in another room. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, she. So Glenda, you and I are going to sit down and have coffee sometime. Um, but last, last, last question. Um, is there anything that you hope to come through the HSA before the end of the year um, that you would like to see? Oh, we mean like a new bird, an exciting new bird. Doesn't have to be, I guess. Uh, no, I always like to see evening. I haven't seen any evening grosbeaks yet, and uh, I gather that they're, they're they're moving through. So I'd like to see those. Yeah, you get the right morning at Woodland Cemetery, you might see quite a few, but yeah. So and, folks, uh, yep. yeah. Yeah, um, I haven't seen a golden eagle. Uh, the next, late this week, could be good for golden eagles. The wind's, the wind's out of the north or northwest. Uh, perfect time. Great. Um, I, I, I suspect there's a few folks here that, are, that would be hoping to see either of those species, myself included. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll keep our eyes on that. Bob, uh, we had 50, sorry, we had 60 folks attend the chat tonight. There are still... 36 in the room. Any closing comments um, to folks before we sign off? I look forward to seeing you in person. <laughs> um, 908, we're going to likely start receiving the first um, the first announcements of, um, of the municipal election tonight. So yeah, good we'll let everyone you. go. Um, and interesting times ahead for, for municipalities in Ontario. 
So I look forward to seeing some results there. But Bob, on behalf of the Hamilton Naturals Club and the Bird Study Group and all those who attended tonight, thank you so much for sharing yours and Glenda's big trip out west and back. Um, we really appreciate your time and efforts. Thank you, Jackson, and for all your help and support in, in bringing this off, helping me bring this off. Thank you. Ah, of course. Yeah. Um, and I can't wait to hear about your next trip. So uh, thank okay. you so much. And folks, thanks again for coming tonight. We will catch you at some point down the road. Enjoy the last couple of days of October. <laughs>